First thing I want to point out is there is a, a steel bridge design handbook that's recently been passed back to the NSBA from the Federal Highway Department. And in that handbook is volume 19. Volume 19 is the, is the corrosion protection chapter. So everything we're going to talk about today is covered here. So I'd highly recommend you go to our website and download that. And you can see the URL there on the screen, AISC.org backslash SBDH. That will take you to our steel bridge design handbook. Also want to point out that we have a, a dedicated corrosion protection webpage on our website. So you can see the URL, there, URL at the top of the screen there, but that talks about all, um, all, the, all these systems as well and gives some, some references to some other general resources also. So the first question you might have when you're designing a steel bridge is what corrosion protection system to use. And you can see these are the five basic types or the five basic systems. There might be a few more than this, but these are by and large the most common. I would argue that even the, the top two or, or maybe three of these five are probably more common than others. But all these systems work and they're all appropriate when designing a steel bridge. The question comes as to what use do you have? What's the macro environment you're building your bridge in? What's perhaps even a micro environment that you're gonna be building your bridge in? Are some considerations of which choice to go into? I'm not gonna get into that, that decision tree, just gonna introduce these systems. But as you can see, the first system that we're gonna have here is uncoated weathering steel. And I'm not gonna steal the thunder of Jennifer and Tom, so I'll let them talk more about that one. Liquid applied coatings is the second one we'll, we'll introduce today, otherwise known as paint. The third one is thermal spray coatings, which is also known as metallizing. The fourth one is hot dip galvanizing, which probably most people are familiar with, but we'll touch on that. And then last but not least is A70950CR. This is a low grade stainless steel. So I'm gonna to touch on that. I have one slide on that only, but we're gonna to touch on that also. So let's get going. First one is uncoated weathering steel. And if you look within the, the design code or ASTM A709 more specifically, you'll see a, a summary of various grades. Anything with a W represents weathering steel. And so all these designations are, are weathering grades. And in a nutshell is what these do is weathering steel develops a patina. So it develops this patina. So the outside, the outside surface of the steel actually forms a thick corrosion, a thick barrier protection layer that protects the inner layers of steel. And so again, uh, I know that, that Tom and Jennifer are going to dig into this a little bit more. And so I don't want to waste time and, 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 and waste, um, waste everybody's time again and, and, and let them cover this more, more in depth. But it essentially is what this does is it, is it forms this barrier protection and you can, it's very common to have these pinholes, but it forms a dark color, a dark brown color that you can see on the steel itself. But that's normal and that's to be expected and that's what protects the steel from corrosion protection. I did mention ASTM A70950CR. This is the low grade stainless steel. These are some examples you'll see here on some of these pictures. The one thing you'll notice is it's not the stainless steel that you think about for your appliances, okay? The difference between that is the percent chromium that's included in this, in, in, the, in the chemical makeup. So roughly speaking, you have to have 11% chrome to be considered a stainless steel, but it does provide much better corrosion protection than that of weathering steel. To, just for reference sake, if you're thinking of your stainless steel appliances, they have upwards of about 30% chrome included in, in those chemical makeup. So that's what's the difference. So just don't expect to get a shiny um, silver bridge when you, when you think of, of, a, of a stainless steel in, in terms of bridge construction. One of the more common types of systems that we have for steel bridges is modern um, liquid applied coating systems. So this is paint systems. What we see here on the right here is just a cutaway or a, or a slice, if you will, of a typical corrosion or a typical paint system. We have the steel substrate on the bottom. Usually we use a zinc rich primer as the first coat. Um, there can be an intermediate coat, which is usually an epoxy coat. Um, and then the top coat um, is typically a urethane coat. This is just the definition though for a traditional three coat paint system. There's many different types of paint systems. There's two coat systems and there's even one coat systems. So this is just an example of a typical, of a typical paint system. You can, you can also use an, an inorganic or organic zinc primer, zinc rich primer, you can use either one of those. Um, and, and some have benefits over others, but again, I'm just introducing some of these slides, some of these different systems today, but this is a typical paint system. 
One thing I want to get past, though, is sometimes when people think of paint systems, they think of some of these old paint systems. This is an old paint system. All right, this used an old lead system back from pre-1980, and this is not looking good, admittedly. This is not the modern paint systems of today, and I want to get into that just a little bit. Um, before I do, though, this is typically a barrier corrosion protection system. However, the zinc-rich primer does provide some cathodic protection. And this is, these are just some examples of you know, how nice some of, the, some of the new modern corrosion protection systems, typically, the, or more specifically, the modern paint systems look. OK, I mentioned, I mentioned these old lead paint systems, though. So these were common you know, back in the 60s and 70s. However, more currently, since like 1990, we've been using modern paint systems. So this is what we need to get in our head when we think of paint systems of today, OK? I believe I have a, oh, I went one too far. My apologies. This is a little, this is a timeline of some of the, some of the new, some of the new advances in paint systems. And you, as you can see, pre-1970, lead systems were very common. Well, Zinkrich primers were introduced in the mid-70s. And almost more importantly, from 1980 to 1990, we started to recognize the benefits of surface preparation. And since then, so since about 1990 is when we've started to recognize our modern paint systems. And so I want you to get out of your head this when you think of paint systems and think more about the, the, the newer systems that I showed in, in, the previous, in the previous slides. One thing we also need to talk about when talking about paint systems are the different thicknesses of coating and how that affects cost. So, this, the table on the left here is our coating thicknesses for various systems. On the bottom, you can see that, you know, there's a one coat IOZ system on the left of the, of the I'm going to go back here just to, uh, to focus our, our attention a little bit better. The table on the left here, so this is a coating thickness for a single coat system, a two coat polyaspartic, and then a three coat systems there. You can see as you add more coats, you add more thickness. That should go without saying. However, when you do do that, when you add more coats, you also add more time in the shop that it takes to apply these systems. So just keep that in the back of your mind. Don't necessarily always think that more coats is better. Sometimes that can add more, more chance for human error, and it also costs more, typically speaking. So just keep that in the back of your mind when you're, when you're considering um, some liquid applied coating systems. So generally speaking though, as you add more coats, it takes more time and therefore, can potentially cost more money. So we highly recommend you reach out to your fabricator when you're considering some paint systems and which one to use. They can give you some good insight into uh, the, the cost implications of that. I mentioned our typical um, three coat systems. These are what we call our workhorse systems. So whether or not you use an organic zinc or an inorganic zinc primer, this is a typical three coat systems. Some of the new systems that are being investigated and being used more and more these days are simply a single coat of IOZ of an inorganic zinc primer, an IOZ with, a, with an acrylic latex top coat, and also some two coat systems using organic zinc primer and polyaspartic top coats are some of the more newer systems that are being used these days. Looking at my time here, I have about five minutes. All right, which we should have plenty of time. We have two more systems to get through. Um, the fourth one to mention here is thermal spray coatings, also known as metallizing. This is a combination, when I describe this, is, is think of a combination of a wire-fed welder and a spray painter. So imagine you take, an, you take a gun with two wire feeds coming into it, and there's an electric, there's an electric current pass between it that melts the, the, the steel, if you will, or the, or the actual alloy, and then compressed air blows it on the surface of the steel. The most common types of these are 99% aluminum, 8515, which is 85% zinc, 15% aluminum, which is probably the most common. And then the last one is 99% zinc, which is also relatively common, but I would say 8515 is the, is the most common. But this requires a very angular profile on the substrate because it's requiring on that bond um, from the alloy itself to the steel surface and it's, and it's hot alloy being applied to a cold substrate. So that angular profile is very important and the surface prof and the surface itself, surface prep is very important. These are some examples of what these might look like. As you can gather, they're all relatively gray or silver in color. 
Um, the one on the top left there is, is zinc. The one in the in the, the bottom is 8515, and the one on the top right is the 99% aluminum. So again, they're they're typically gray in color when they come out. You have the option to use a sealer or not to use a sealer. Sealers are probably more common than not, but they are an option. Um, so the TSC is, is typically porous. So sealing can be used to, to seal that, although there's some discussion that it might not absolutely be necessary. And that's a function of the thickness of the coating system itself. The thicker you go, the less permeable it gets. And there becomes a point when the permeability goes to zero and therefore you don't really need a sealer anymore. Um, this is a mechanical process. So for the reasons I described, that it's, you know, it's, it's just, you need an angular profile for it because it's the alloy itself bonding to the surface of the steel. Whereas hot dip galvanizing is a metallurgical process. So I'm guessing we've all probably heard of hot dip galvanizing where we take a piece of steel and we dip it in a hot sink bath, typically in 830 degrees. The, the picture on the right there shows that there's varying layers of the zinc itself. And I'm not gonna, they're gonna test my Greek here um, but essentially you have I have 100% zinc on the outside and tier right adjacent to the steel itself is about 90% zinc. So it varies from 100% zinc to 90 as you get closer to the steel itself. It does provide both a barrier protection system as well as cathodic. The cathodic comes from the zinc itself and the barrier is pretty self-explanatory. It keeps, it keeps water away, water and salt away from the steel itself. So that, that's where the barrier characteristics come into play. This is a typical, typical process in a, in a, in a, in a galvanizing shop. Um, surface preparation is extremely important. Um, degreasing, pickling, and fluxing is also part of the surface prep process, but it's absolutely required before the steel itself is dipped into the zinc bath. And here's a little bit more on that process, but this is, this is definitely required um, that these cleaning solutions um, of the degreasing, pickling, and fluxing are needed because anything that's not clean is will not grow that zinc coating. So it's definitely an important um, aspect of the whole process. Um, this is typically um, governed, I wouldn't say governed, I guess, but the, the American Galvanizing Association, the AGA, they have a lot more information related to this. So I definitely recommend reaching out to them if you have questions about, about galvanizing. But galvanizing is, is a very common, common use, especially for shorter span bridges where the girders can be dipped into, into a bath in, in, in one dip. That, that definitely helps from, from a cost perspective. So very common for shorter span bridges to, to do this, but all these other systems have their time in place, um, whether it be uncoated weathering steel paint systems, um, metallizing or galvanizing, they all have a time in place. It just depends on what your use is, whether or not you're gonna use any one of these systems. 